The Old Testament lesson for today can be found in the book of Isaiah, chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. It's on page 492 of the Brown Bible. Isaiah 12, beginning with verse 1. In that day you will say, I will praise you, O Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger has turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust to not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. The New Testament lesson can be found in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. It's on page 807 of the uh, Brown Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Our gospel lesson is found in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, then 11 through 32. Would you please rise for the reading of the gospel? This is also found on page 740 of the Brown Bible. Luke, chapter 15, beginning with verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will sit out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let us have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. 
The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. This concludes the reading of the lessons. You may be seated. Having grown up in the 60s and 70s, but rock and roll was a big part of my life, and I was kind of dismayed a little bit, or saddened, I guess you could say. I opened the paper this morning early and found out that Keith Emerson died, and apparently it was a suicide. And Keith Emerson is uh, the keyboard player on Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, and uh, in my opinion, he was probably the best keyboardist that I've ever heard. Great, great keyboard player. He could play just about anything. I remember going to see him in concert, and he had like seven or eight different keyboards on three different racks all around him, and he'd be reaching across playing, you know, any given two at the same time. And he always played the right notes. You know, that's what really freaks me out. <laughs> but he was the greatest. You know, from time to time, someone releases a list of the greatest this or the greatest that, and again, referring to rock and roll, it's the, the greatest songs, and you know, at the top of the list is usually either one of these two, Yesterday by Paul McCartney or, or Satisfaction by the Rolling Stones, the greatest song ever. Uh, White Christmas actually has sold the most music. Uh, the greatest movie, you know, of course, there's always a race to see which movie sells the most, but in terms of, uh, you know, figuring for inflation and all that, no movie has ever come close to Gone with the Wind. It's the greatest movie ever in terms of most people seeing it. The greatest parable Jesus ever told is probably and certainly the most popular one, the one that we read today, The Prodigal Son. And it's popular probably for the same reason that it's actually misnamed. We call it The Prodigal Son. Actually, there's three main characters in it, uh, all of whom receive a lot of treatment by Jesus. Uh, but this, it's... The focus is on the wayward son who returns home. And it's a good lesson. And it's a lesson, you know, that we can all identify with if we've repented and come to Christ. If he's our Lord and Savior, we can identify with that lost son. We've been there. But there are three characters, and I want to take a look at all three of them briefly this morning. First of all, the lost son, the prodigal son. It's good, really, that we see ourselves in the prodigal son, for that's a picture of mankind. We're known as uh, in depravity. That's a, just a, a word that means that we're hopelessly lost on our own power. Our, our all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, the Bible says. There is no one righteous, not even one. And we marvel at the story of Abraham pleading with God to save the city of Sodom and Gomorrah if there's only 10 people left, but there's not even one righteous, the Bible says, and that's in the whole world. And Isaiah says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We each have turned to his own way. That's our human condition. The Bible's very clear. We all deserve death and hell. The soul that sins shall die. That's a supreme spiritual law. That's a law that is unbreakable. It's the law of sin and its consequences put into place at the creation of the world. That's the law that got Adam and Eve into trouble. God told them, don't eat that fruit or you will die. The soul that sins is the soul that shall die. Why is it the mortality rate is still holding steady at 100%? It's because we all sin. We're not sinners because we commit sins we commit sins because we're sinners that's our nature that's what we do as human beings in our fallen nature sin abounds in our inborn human nature the lost son 
We can think of all kinds of adjectives for him. And if you look at 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5, you'll see them all listed there too. But things like greedy, prideful, lustful, impatient, disrespectful, pleasure-loving, short-sighted. And the list can go on and on and on. But really, that just describes all of us. He was distracted by the things of this world, and how much is that a temptation in our day and age, particularly in Western civilization in which we live, when we have so much? We call them blessings, and they are, but these blessings can distract us away from what's really important. Following such desires, the desires that come from the lust and the greed from this world, only leads to misery and to despair and ultimately to death. And the lost son was on that path. He represents the pilgrimage that we all go through or have gone through at one point in our lives. Everyone who accepts Christ has been down that path because we all are headed that direction when we're born. But If you've accepted Christ, you've turned around, you've taken that road that leads homeward again. As the lost son found out, life and acceptance are only to be had by returning home. And our home is with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died on the cross to cancel the effects of sin in our lives, to bring us forgiveness. Jesus is the way. He's that pathway that leads home to the Father. If you've not made that return trip, come home to Jesus today. Secondly, there's the Father. Some may say that really uh, we could call the Father. He's the one that's truly the prodigal. He's the one that's really the wastrel, the one that wasted things. He's the one that caved into his wayward son's wishes. He's the one that enabled this lost son to waste away his inheritance. Really, though, how do we learn anything of importance? How do we learn life's lessons? We learn them best by experience, don't we? I can, you know, I can just sit here and name off all the things mom and dad ever told me what to do and what not to do. And every single one of those things, I had to do it myself. How many of you ever remember, maybe even if you don't remember, mom and dad saying, don't touch a hot stove, don't touch a hot iron, but you did it anyway. I wonder what that feels like. I wonder why it's such a big deal. Why should I not touch it? And the minute you get your finger close, you find out. Then your learning becomes real. If we as children would only learn to heed our parents' advice, commands, instruction, just by hearing it, we'd soon be raising a perfect generation. We'd learn perfectly. We wouldn't need to go through it ourselves. But that's not the way things work. I mean, the first word that a kid learns is, you know, usually mama or daddy. The next word is usually no. And then after that comes, I can do it myself or mine. But God is kind of like that parent. In fact, he's very much like that parent in that if we're set on doing our own thing, there comes a point he's going to let us do it. He's given us the law, Ten Commandments. He's given us the Bible. He gives us the Holy Spirit to prompt us. But if we insist on going our own way, as headstrong children, ultimately, he'll let us. It's like, oh, if that's the way you want it, go ahead and learn and see for yourself. Just as the father in the prodigal son story did. But the main point of the father in the parable is the love and the mercy that he shows to his sons. And yes, he showed them to both. We concentrate again on that lost son, but he had mercy and love on both of them. You know, the father went out. It's very unfatherlike in that society well, to run down the road for sure, but to go out and meet this, these children and plead with them. You know, as the father's the authority figure here. 
He doesn't need to be running around trying to convince his kids of anything. They should be coming to him. But the father goes out. He shows love and mercy to both. To the lost son who returned, he gave the best robe. That's clothing reserved for the very best, the guest of honor. Or in some cases, you might, it's like Joseph in the amazing Technicolor dream coat. It was the favored child, the one who received grace. The father gave this lost son who returned a signet ring, a sign of belonging, and not only that, a sign of authority in the household. Remember, this is the kid who threw everything away. He owned nothing, and he never would ever again own anything. But his dad gave him that signet ring. He gave him shoes, a sign of inclusion in the family. What was the lost son's little speech? I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me your servant. But no, servants go barefoot. Children get shoes. And the father killed the fatted calf. He made a feast, the best he had to offer, the very best for the son who returned. True, the lost son did squander his inheritance. He threw away one-third of everything the father had. But as long as that son who returned lived in his father's house, his needs would be provided for. He'd have everything he needed and to spare. He would live pretty good. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the Bible says. And yet, he shares it with us, his children, his lost children and his ones who have returned alike. Jesus gave us that great and precious promise in the Sermon on the Mount. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and what? All these things will be given you as well. To those who call God Father, He gives life and He gives salvation. John's Gospel says, He came to that which was His own, but His own did not receive Him, speaking of the Lord Jesus. Yet to all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. We do receive shoes. We do receive the best robe. We receive a Father's inheritance. And in John 5, 24, Jesus said, I tell you the truth, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. He lives. Eternal life is alive in our hearts the moment we accept Christ. We go to heaven because we already have eternal life. We have hope of rising from the dead because we already have eternal life. That's what makes us rise. It's not something we get later. We have it the moment we accept Christ. And it's because the Father gives it to us because of His love and His mercy and His grace. But the parable doesn't stop with verse 24. It doesn't stop with Father throwing a party for the lost son who returned. It doesn't stop with all this uh, goodwill and, and all that. There's the older brother. The parable continues with the older brother. He did everything right. He didn't leave home. He worked. He kept the farm going or whatever business it was. He did everything his dad told him to do. He said the right things. He did the right things. He was working when the son came home. The party had gone ahead and started without him. He was so busy taking care of things, he didn't even know he'd come home until the party was underway. But when he found out, he was jealous. He was resentful. I would imagine a little bit of hate mixed in for that little brother who did, after all, squander the father's property. He trampled on his rights as a son, something that he, older brother, would never dream of doing. Older brother referred to him as this son of yours. Didn't even claim him as his own brother anymore. But the father 
reminded older brother that all the property, everything that he could look around and see, everything that the father now owned would pass on to him, older brother. After all, younger brother had taken his share already. It all belonged to older brother. Everything that the father owned. But surely, surely when your own family member thinks the better of it and comes home and returns, surely they could throw a party at the very least. Surely they could celebrate. He was dead to them before. He didn't even exist as far as they knew. And for all they knew, he might have been physically dead. But now he wasn't. He was alive. The family was reunited. They were complete. A lost soul had come home. And then the story stops. We don't know what the older brother did. Did he go in? Did he go back out and sulk some more? Bring a lawsuit against the father? We don't know what he did. Why didn't Jesus finish the story? He was telling the story, all three parables in Luke 15, to the Pharisees who didn't like didn't like the fact that Jesus was associating with tax collectors and sinners. All those unsavory people who didn't care about keeping the law, who spent their time in unprofitable activities. While well, they went about keeping the law. Well, they were God's chosen ones, and they showed it. Well, they were meticulous tithers. They did everything right. But Jesus was offering to them the same gift of life that he offered those sinners. The older brother had stayed home physically, but he was just as lost spiritually. The Pharisees offered their sacrifices. They kept the law. They taught the people God's word. But what did God say about them? He said, They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And in the same way, today, we can go to church and pray and read the Bible and live a good life and then think we're entitled to go to heaven. But we're sinners too. We need Jesus too. We have no reason to look down on anyone else because we too sin and fall short of the glory of God. We too are like sheep that have gone astray, even if only in our hearts. And I say only in our hearts. That's the worst place. That's where life is. Does God somehow owe us something if we do something good every once in a while if we live a better life than the neighbor Bob. We're going to all, you know, everybody's going to be better than somebody else and worse than somebody else, but that's not the point. We have to be perfect to get into heaven, and only one person did that, and that's the Lord Jesus. Jesus said it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but those who are sick. As soon as we realize that we're sick with sin, that's when Jesus can help us. The Apostle John says this in his first letter. Whoever loves the Father loves his child as well. If we truly love God, we'll love one another. The Pharisees, they were looking down on those people, those other people they thought didn't deserve Jesus' attention, didn't deserve God's grace and mercy. The truth is, none of us deserve it, but we can rejoice that God gives it. If we truly love God, we will love one another, no matter what our background. If God loves other people, Besides us, how can we do any less? So the point of the parable is, of course, come home to Jesus if you haven't. Come home to the Lord. If you've not turned around 
from self-centered life and given your heart to Jesus, do that. But having done that, don't look down on others, no matter who they are. Thomas Akempis said, all of us are frail, but consider no one no more frail than yourself. And come home to Jesus, who died and rose again for you. Invite others to join the family, and then share that love and joy that salvation gives with one another. In Jesus' name, amen.